Hi, this is Paul Turner with Venify, and today we're going to give you a brief introduction to encryption. We're going to talk a little bit about symmetric cryptography, asymmetric cryptography, and also certificates. To start this introduction, we're actually going to start with a simple example, something that you may have done in school. It's called the Caesar cipher, and it was actually invented by Julius Caesar years and years ago. Julius Caesar was a brilliant military strategist. Unfortunately, for the photo shoot that we did, he wasn't too happy, and that might have been because of the crew that he was working with, but in all seriousness, when he wanted to communicate a message to his field generals, who would, would be in other parts of uh, the world, or at least other parts of Europe, um, when he wanted to communicate that message, he would have a messenger and even, for example, um, one or more guards that would go with that messenger to protect uh, uh, the, the delivery of the message. But he still had the risk of somebody intercepting the message, and that could really impact the military strategies that he was trying to execute. So, for example, if he wanted to send a message such as attack, what he did was he looked at the alphabet and he said, you know what, instead of just using the alphabet as everybody would expect, when we're going to write down the message, let's go ahead and shift the letters of the alphabet by three so that an A becomes a D and a B becomes an E so on and so forth, so that ultimately the message that we got was not intelligible to the common uh, observer or somebody that would have intercepted the message. Now, effectively what he was doing is he was shifting three, so to each of his field generals, he would just need to tell them, shift in the opposite direction when you receive this message so you can decipher the message. If we look at this, the shift is the algorithm that's used. You may have heard of algorithms in cryptography, and in this case, we just use a simple example to kind of illustrate what an algorithm is. Next, we have the key, which is three. Now, in this particular case, we have 25 possibilities for a key, right? Because if we don't shift, that's, uh, that's gonna be the first option, and then we have 25 other options to shift. And so there are 25 options in here, and uh, Caesar chose to shift three. If he had wanted to send different messages uh, securely to different generals or different parties, he may have shifted three for one and six for another to make it more difficult for one or the other to, to intercept the other's messages. Today, if we fast forward, what we have are much more sophisticated algorithms that are doing mathematical transforms on the messages that are provided that need to be encrypted. And the keys that we have are chosen from much larger domains. So instead of only having 25 options, in the case of uh, today's keys, if we're using 128 or 256-bit keys, we have a much larger number of possible values to pick from. So if we even just look at 2 to 128, that equates to this number. So when I'm selecting a key randomly so that somebody else can't guess it, I can select from anywhere from 0 up to this number, and I won't even try to say how, you know, describe how that number would be named. Uh, but you can see it's a very large number. So now what we have is the possibility of taking and using one of these ready-made algorithms today it would typically be AES, along with randomly selecting a number within this space that, that we see here. Now you might think, well, that's pretty easy, but it turns out, interestingly, that selecting a random number uh, truly randomly is, is actually very difficult because there are ways of kind of predicting the algorithm that would be used to, to randomly select and to reduce the number of possible values that somebody might pick from. So there's been a lot of work in this area of randomly selecting a key from the domain of possible values. So now let's take and look at this in today's operations. And the first one that we're going to use as an example is the example of data at rest or storing data. So here I've got data that I want to take and I want to store and then I want to be able to read that data. But I don't want, if anybody is able to gain access, let's say that this is a remote database or a remote file system, if anybody gets onto that system, I don't want them to be able to read that data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to generate, or frankly, randomly select a key. Uh, they typically call that generating a key. And I'm going to use AES in this case to encrypt the data so that when it is stored onto the disk, that anybody that, that sees it won't be able to read it unless they have 
the symmetric key. This is what we call symmetric encryption for storage. Now take a moment and just think about what are the key management challenges here? What are the things that I need to do to ensure that the key is managed properly? Now, one piece is to make sure that I keep this key secret and that nobody else is able to get access to it because if they are able to get access to it, they'll be able to read that data, which is obviously not something that I would like. The next one is I've got to make sure I don't lose that key because I selected it randomly and if I lose that key, I can't get access to the data because just like anybody else, I would be trying to guess this random number. So I need to make sure that I don't lose the key that I've generated. So those are a couple of the key management challenges that you have for data at rest or stored data. Now let's look at communications where one party on the left here wants to send a secure message to a party on the right. In this particular case, using symmetric encryption, the party on the left will generate a symmetric key, and then they need to securely communicate that symmetric key to the other party so that when they encrypt the message, that the other party can decrypt it. Great, so now we have secure communications between two parties. Now let's look at the key management challenges here. Well, obviously we still have the issue of keeping the key secret, but now we have two copies of keys that we need to keep secret. And in fact, to begin with, we need to make sure that we keep the key secret as we're distributing it to the other party. And you might think to yourself, well, wait a minute. If I've got a secure way to communicate a key to another party, why don't I just use that for my data? And the obvious answer is, if I only have to be careful once or occasionally in transferring data to another party, then I'll do that very carefully and then I can be much more casual, for lack of a better term, in sending my data securely because now I've got the same key on both sides. So that's one key management challenge that I have. Another one is being able to rotate the key because as we mentioned, we need to keep that key secret. Since there's more copies of it, there's a possibility of that key getting compromised. And so what we want to do is reduce the possibility of somebody using a compromised key for an extended period of time. So we rotate it periodically, maybe once a year, maybe even more often than that. And so this is symmetric encryption for communications. Now you might look at this and just think to yourself, okay, if I'm trying to communicate with a bunch of other parties on the internet, for example, I'm trying to communicate with a bank or an online trader, if I need to be able to exchange symmetric keys with each of these parties, that's pretty tough, right? To be able to do that securely and make sure that that key gets uh, to them in a, in a secure manner is very difficult. And frankly, as things were unfolding with the internet, some, some mathematicians and cryptographers were looking at this problem. They were thinking, how can we make this better so that we don't have this challenge of having to exchange an individual key with every other party that we want to securely communicate with? And what they came up with was this concept of asymmetric cryptography. And what they found is that using a certain algorithm, that they were able to select two numbers that were related to each other in such a way that they could take data and encrypt it with one of the keys and be able to decrypt it with the other. And the same in the other direction that they could encrypt with uh, the, the bottom key and decrypt with the top key. But one of the attributes of this algorithm is that when they encrypted with the top key, they could not decrypt with the top key and vice versa with the bottom. Using these attributes, what they said is, how about if we take a party who's being communicated to, they generate one of these key pairs, and they keep one of the keys secret. We'll call that the private key. The other key, or the other number, they can take and they can communicate that to whoever in the world they want to communicate with. They can actually publish it on a website. They don't care who gets access to that. Because as soon as somebody takes and encrypts information with that, Nobody else in the world will be able to decrypt it except for the person or the system that's holding that private key. So if we think about this, and this is an analogy that a friend of mine gave me, this is much like a safe. What I do is I take and I generate a whole bunch of safes and I give them all the same combination and I send them out all over the world to people. 
And people say, hey, I want to securely communicate with Paul, so I'm going to take and I'm going to put information into that safe, close the door, lock it, and all of a sudden they can't open it anymore. They can, you know, jiggle the door and everything, but it's not going to open. It will only open for me because I've got that combination. So now you start looking at this and you say, wow, this is, this is a great mechanism that I can use. And this is what we call public key cryptography or asymmetric encryption um, for communications. Now with this, you might ask yourself, okay, what are the key management challenges here? Now, again, we still have the case where we need to make sure that this party keeps this key, this private key secret, right? But in addition to that, for the sender, they have the challenge of making sure that they're using the correct public key. Now, these numbers that are selected are actually even much larger than symmetric keys, and we saw that those can be very large numbers, right? So now a party is challenged with saying, okay, I want to communicate with this bank or this online trader or whoever they may want to communicate with. I want to do that securely. How do I make sure that I'm using the right key? Because if there was an attacker that wanted to get in the middle, and this is called a man in the middle attack, what they would do is take and provide the sender their public key, their number, and the sender, being none the wiser, would take and encrypt the data with that key. Now the attacker can take and decrypt it with their private key, make a copy, and then very quickly they're going to take and encrypt it with the intended recipient's public key. Then it'll be decrypted by the recipient with their private key, and they'll be none the wiser. They'll say, oh, I just received a secret message from the sender on the left. However, in the middle, we had this man in the middle who's watching these communications take place, so the communications are long, no longer secure. So a group of people got together and said, how can we improve on this? And the concept that they came up with is, how about if we take these safes or these public keys and let's associate a name with them. And this is where a certificate comes in. So now I still have this system or this person on the right who wants to receive secure messages from the party on the left. They're going to generate a key pair. They're going to, get, they're going to take one of the keys, keep it secret. The other one they're going to use as their public key. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put their name. Let's say in the case of the safe, we would stamp their name on the side of that safe. Or in the case of a public key, we would take and just create, in effect, a small document that has the name and the public key and create a certificate. And that's what a certificate does. It binds a public key to a name. You may have heard about certificate expiration dates and a bunch of other things that go into a certificate. But at the end of the day, the purpose of a certificate is to bind a public key to a name. And now, when this sender wants to send data securely, they receive this certificate. They have to receive the certificate first. Um, and they take and they look and they say, okay, this is the name of the party here on the right. So I know that this is the correct party. Now I'm going to use the public key, this number within here, to securely send data over to that other party. And basically, this is using certificates for encrypted communications between parties. Now, everything that we've discussed up to this point has been focused on confidentiality, making sure that when we send a message or store data that somebody else can't read it. But there's another very important concept on the Internet or, frankly, in any communications, and that's being able to authenticate the sender of a message. And in this case, what we're going to have is we're going to have two parties again. The party on the left is going to send the message, let's say a bank transfer or even a stock trade request, and that's going to go to this other party, and they want to make sure that they know that it came from the correct party, because otherwise they may be doing a, a funds transfer into an attacker's Swiss bank account. So they really want to make sure that they know who sent that message. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this asymmetric cryptography around. This party is now going to generate a key pair, and they're going to have a private key and a public key. They're going to get a certificate with that public key. Again, these these, number, these keys are just numbers, right? Um, but effectively, they're going to go get a certificate that contains that key, that number, and their name. So now, when they send the message, they're going to take and they're going to encrypt that message with their private key. For those of you familiar with digital signatures, I'm not going to go into thumbprints, just to keep this simple. So, uh, so effectively, what they're going to do is they're going to take this message 
they're going to use their private key and encrypt that message. And now when the recipient receives that, they're going to use the sender's certificate to validate and say, first of all, this is the sender's name, so I've got the correct sender. Now let me take this public key, this number, and let me validate the, sign the, the uh, signature. Effectively, let me decrypt this message, which tells me that if I'm able to decrypt with this public key, the only number that could have been used to encrypt it is this sender's private key. So this is how we authenticate messages is that we have the senders get a certificate and any time that they want to send a message they effectively encrypt the message with their private key and the recipient is able to authenticate it with the public key because that public key is inside of a certificate that has the sender's name in it. This is using certificates for authentication. The next thing you might look at is say, hey, I actually want to send a confidential message that's also authenticated, so I want to do both. Well, in that case, what's going to happen is the sender here on the left, what they're going to do is they're going to take that message that they want to send and have authenticated and secure. They're going to start by encrypting it with their private key. Now they've got something that is authenticated. Anybody that, that um, has this, the sender's certificate can authenticate and frankly decrypt it. So it's not considered secure from a confidentiality perspective. But now what they're going to do is they're going to take and they're going to use the recipient's certificate, their public key, and they're going to encrypt that message. So now we have something that can only be read by the holder of the private key. They send this message over to that intended recipient and now they're going to take and they're going to say, okay, I've got this message. Let me start by decrypting it with my private key. And what they end up with is this message that was encrypted originally with the private key. So now they can authenticate that message with the certificate uh, from the sender. And they know, first of all, the message was secure because they were able to decrypt it with their private key. And it was uh, sent by the proper sender because they were able to authenticate that with the certificate. And this is how we can combine these two concepts. So now let's review what we've covered. We started talking about symmetric cryptography or encryption and found that there were challenges with distributing keys across a large number of parties. So we looked at this concept of asymmetric cryptography or public key cryptography that would allow us to distribute one number to anybody and know that if they encrypted with that number or that key, that we would be able to decrypt with it. But we weren't sure if we were using the right number in every case. And so this concept of certificates was added on to asymmetric or public key cryptography to enable us to identify the correct key, both for securely sending a message and also for authenticating our messages. Thanks very much for joining us today. And hopefully this has provided you a little bit of an introduction into the world of cryptography. Have a great day.